Let me bring up our uh, esteemed colleagues here and we will walk through a little bit of a sort of a bio intro in terms of who these gentlemen are, how they're associated with interactive advertising and the differing uh, pods that we see. And then from there, we're going to show some examples. I thought it'd be great to have not only us just talking amongst ourselves and um, have an opportunity to share some interesting video executions that I think will level the, the playing field and set the stage for us then to have some healthy dialogue. Mm -hmm. And from there, we'll go into a number of discussions and conversations around different areas related to these new pod opportunities that are bringing themselves to the forefront of the marketplace. And then at the end, we definitely want to open it up to Q&A because I'm sure you'll be tired of listening to us and much more interested in hearing what you guys have to say and how we can move from there. So we are going to first do a quick introduction down the line. We'll start with you, Mark. Great. Uh, I'm Mark Brown. I'm the uh, managing partner at Canvas Worldwide here in Los Angeles. And I'm Jim O'Donnell. I oversee our West Coast ad sales team at Hulu. Uh, Dan Callahan, Fox Networks, based in New York, overseeing our programmatic sales team. Uh, Chris Pizarro, Canoe, I'm head of marketing, sales, and business development uh, at Canoe. So we have quite a wide, diverse group, and I think that's what's going to make for some healthy dialogue here. So I'm going to first open up the uh, PowerPoint here and see if we got this <laughs> working. So um, Chris put this slide together talking about new ad units, new pods, and what's happening in between the content. Chris, you want to walk them through this real quick? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, we, you know, we were challenged to talk about pods and new ad units and all of that. Um, and in my classic boring fashion um, <laughs> was, uh, you know, what, what we've seen change at Canoe, and for those of you who don't know, we um, help national programming networks put ads into video on demand uh, through your cable system. So you're watching Fox and you're watching an FX show and uh, you hit play, the ad goes in, it's going through our technology. Where we're spending a lot of time these days with, with Fox and Turner's and Viacom's and all of our clients um, is how has the pod weight and ad load shifting in an on-demand um, universe, right? So we're not talking about new ad units, we're really talking about the actual traditional pod, how is that changing because of things like Netflix and YouTube and ad loads or lack of ad loads that are there? So this is uh, just an example of how we describe this to our clients and the kind of combinations they're coming up with. Because they're all really sophisticated on the linear side to know, okay, pretty simple. I put eight ads in, a, in each break and my third break is for local. I'm done. I know how to manage that. I know how to work with that, and I'm good. That was the um, good old days, right? That was when yeah. things those were, were the, <laughs> Those were the good old days. Let's go to lunch and you know, stay in early or send a, send a, a letter, and you're, and you're good. Um, but you know, those days are gone to the amount of 5, 10, 15, 20% of my business. So what does my new business look like? Um, and so this is what we talk to our clients about. Hey, if you have a genre, you might have a 15-second pre-roll, um, and then you might have uh, five mid-rolls, uh, five in, a, in a each mid-roll break, and those might be up to 60 seconds each, and then you could have a post-roll of that might be five seconds, or any different combinations. So just put that up there uh, just to set up the fact of, yes, there's a whole bunch of new ad units that folks like Hulu have, and it's great stuff, um, but also there's still a lot of work and finding out what is the right mix that's even just taking place in the traditional pod itself. Great, thanks Chris. So now we're going to take a peek at some of these new ad unit types that are out there. And thanks to Jim, he's gonna walk us through a couple of these. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I mean, we think a lot about ad load and the ad experience and you know, we know it's directly tied to not only a successful subscription business, whether you're Hulu or a cable operator, but it's also tied to the effectiveness of the advertising. So um, we'll show you a couple of ones here there that, uh, that we work on that we, uh, that we like to, to think uh, do pretty well. Uh, one is this premium slate. So a slate sets up the show. You know, it's generally a pretty boring static slate. And we thought adding video to that would make it uh, a little more interesting. Here we go. Whoops. The green button, the big green one. Yeah. Oops, that one. There you go. There you go. Presented by Marvel's Ant-Man. So very short, very quick. Doesn't really be, it's unobtrusive to the viewer, but it gets the idea across and it includes, uh, includes video. This is one that we started a long time ago, which is our ad selector, and we really believe choice is super important for viewers. 
So this gives the, the viewer the opportunity to choose what ad they want to see at the beginning of the stream. We Which usually give two to three do choices. You prefer? Oh, excuse me? Hi, I have a smart idea for fast, delicious meals. So what's cool about that too is uh, as a marketer, you can take a look in real time and see which video people are choosing more frequently. And you can use that to optimize you know, your, your linear buy and say this spot seems to be working better for us, right? And then interactivity. So we really believe that there's a huge future in interactive ads uh, in the living room as well as across the other platforms. So we will create ads that um, are done custom, that uh, use the, the marketer's assets that help them really do something that's more engaging for, uh, for the viewer. So this one's pretty cool. It's done by Craft. It's a little tiny bit long, but it's kind of cute. We would like to offer you the choice on how to watch this video. Who's not going to feed the kid, right? That's horrible. <laughs> now the viewer kind of plays around with it. Watching Hulu, huh? Well, could you feed me first? I also would pick the pizza rolls. Pizza rolls! A classic. Nom, 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 nom. All right, spoiler alert, he picks the Kraft macaroni and cheese. It happens to have the most amount of protein, so I won't <laughs> go through it. And then this, uh, this one here is sequential targeting. We get, we'd asked a lot about that, and we've done a lot of um, research around that. And, and it does show that ads are more effective when you can tell a story throughout the stream, uh, as long as it's a reasonably interesting story and you don't sort of beat the, the viewer over the head with it. So this is an example of one that we did for, uh, for ABC. All right. Should have used the Fox example, am I right? <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Presented Fox by <laughs> Designated Survivor. <laughs> premieres tonight, 10, 9 central on ABC. So you get the slate to start it out, then here comes your first spot. Hi, Dad. Who is this? Your daughter? Well, my daughter's asleep. I kissed her goodnight almost two hours ago. When are you and Mommy coming home? There are times when we make history, and there are times when history makes us. To be continued. Designated Survivor, series premiere tonight, 10, 9 central. Let the viewer know there's something more coming. Hope to keep them through the, uh, through the show. Want, uh, Gets to the next ad break and the ever popular Simply Alfred Hitchcock presents. Members of the family. <laughs> we need to leave now. And then picks up the story. So, you know, I don't want to sound too pitchy, but we were asked for examples, and, and, and I, I would like to say that I think that Hulu's done a good job uh, in being pioneers in, in coming up with some of these innovative units. And now we've got great folks like, you know, Truex, uh, a, a Fox property, and people like, you know, Innovate and Brightline that, that everyone can work with as well to really make that experience a lot better for, uh, for I'll turn it over to Dan. Awesome. That was the Fox plug. I yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying to get to the video here that hopefully works. I mean, we're looking at a similar approach to, um, I think the gentleman from Crackle said it earlier, is what's the tolerance for an ad break uh, in a digital environment? And what we're looking to do is maybe change the way a user is consuming our content, give them the option here to uh, skip a traditional two minute and 30 second break for an engagement ad, which we feel it commands a better recall, a better user experience, uh, and a better consumption experience of our shows. Um, so this is an example we have for Wheat Thins. This is a typical pod replacement, and this would replace you know, a mid-roll break, and we're up here to talk about the power of the pod. So um, you know, this is an example of maybe how that pod is changing. Um, and the other great example, I'm not sure if we have it queued up here as well, is um, we're doing stream or, or, yeah, pod replacements throughout a VOD stream. So what we would do is we do an engagement when the VOD decision is made to watch that show. You'd sit through an engagement, and then you'd kind of get thank you cards. So those pods that Chris outlined at the beginning kind of completely go away. So, you know, may take 10 minutes off your VOD viewing uh, experience, but you're being reminded and, and you know, told that you're, you're experiencing this ad-free environment because of the, uh, the efforts of the advertiser at the beginning of the show. So um, these are just a couple of examples we had of what our engagement ad looks like uh, with the decisions. So. Thanks, Dan. Thank um, you. So you can see how the, the marketplace is changing. We're seeing consumers change in terms of their behaviors, their, their habits of viewing. And the media suppliers here that we're working with 
are changing with them. They're providing different types of ad units. But the first thing that comes to my mind is who's driving the change? Is it the consumer? Is it the brand? Is it the agency? Is it the media property? And I'd love, Mark, for you to kickstart with your perspective on who's driving that change from your sure. world. I, to me, I, I think riffing off of uh, what the gentleman from Crackle was saying earlier, it's kind of all of the above, right? Uh, ultimately, it's the consumer that we want to make happy. So from an advertiser and from a media standpoint, the more we can do that and deliver a more engaging ad experience, everybody's a winner. So from an agency standpoint, we're certainly pushing it forward, but we're really just responding what consumers want. So when you're in that response, do you have to go out to the respective media landscape and say, hey, can you guys do this? Or are you getting feedback from the media and saying, here's the greatest and the latest in, in new capabilities? I think it's a little bit of both, right? I mean, I'll give Hulu a lot of credit because I think they've done some amazing things in terms of interactive ad units. And uh, you know, the great thing for us is we get some uh, learning and some intelligence back from that, too. So uh, I think there have been times where we've push media companies to do things uh, you know, the way we would like to see them too, so it's a little bit of both. And how about you guys from the media side? Are you feeling excited that the agencies are on board or a little frustrated in terms of the timelines? Yeah, I mean, I think we're very excited to work with them and get creative around you know, how to get in front of their advertisers or get their advertisers in front of our viewers in, in a more meaningful way, right? I think um, there's few hours in the day for people to be distracted and doing many different things, so we want to take the best advantage of that time that we have to be with that consumer. Um, and, and doing these different types of ads, I think, is a more meaningful ad experience for them. So mm -hmm. we'd love to get creative when someone's willing to. Yeah, I, I like what Chris was saying, though, too, about it's, um, there's the creative piece, which we saw, right. but then there's also rethinking the notion of what a pod is and, and what it should be and what, what the tolerance levels are. And I think they go hand in hand. If you've got ads that are interactive and more interesting, then people are going to be a little bit more tolerant. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you, you, know, you beat them over the head with, with, with um, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten ads in a pod, you're going to lose them. I also think you have to know where there's a fine line because you don't want it to become work for the viewer either, right? They, they don't want to have to do something every single time. Sometimes you, know, you do just want to veg out and have your glass of Chardonnay, I think it was, <laughs> uh, which sounds really great right now. Um, but yeah, I think you don't want to make it too much work. Yeah, and what's What's uh, sort of what's driving a little bit of, of uh, our brand is uh, an interesting place actually coming from uh, our MVPDs, from the cable operators, right. mm -hmm. because, because they're that touch point for cable VOD, right, in the consumer's eyes. Uh, they call Comcast. They call Charter. They call Cox. Right? It's, it's that whole thing of who's, who's my customer. Um, and in turn, they, um, they, they give us a call. They call the programmers. And then really, it is right now, it's really been this working group of sorts between the MVPD, the programmer, and Canoe in terms of just implementing that, uh, which, is, which is real interesting. And it's, it's cool because we can do it based on fact, right? Because we serve every ad in the VOD stream, we can see when everything's starting, when it's stopping, and when there's consumer um, fall off, right? So the, the nice part is now that we're doing this in real time, might be a little annoying to the consumer if we're playing around in real time, but I think Everyone here today says, well, we're playing around in real time. Um, we can make those sort of decisions and change those ad maps on the fly as we find out what the right combination is. Right. But ultimately, we think about content as king. It was mentioned earlier today. Is the content of the spots and the length of the spots changing? So, so when you think about the content of the spots and the length of, we saw the seven second, we saw 15, we saw 30s, and you know, there's varying lengths. Do you anticipate? a dramatic change in the consumer or the viewer's attention span now because we're seeing a, a greater proliferation of interactive units? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think everyone at this point kind of knows the whole goldfish analogy that they have more of an attention span than human beings do. <laughs> um, but I think that that's it, is you've got all these new media options and it's driving uh, consumer expectations, you know, and that, that's the problem. It's like, okay, I'm used to just Netflix or Hulu or wherever, it's like the next show and the next show and you know, what's this interruption? And unless we, from an advertiser standpoint, give them something compelling that's going to get their attention and their interest, they're just ready to move on to the next thing. I think also, you know, VOD world, what's nice is you're not constrained by the length of a pod. Mm -hmm. And therefore, your fun creative team can have a great time with sixes and sevens and nines and 23s and 34s, whatever they, whatever they want it to be. Yep. And Absolutely. It's, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I mean, I think, um, you know, live sports, it's, it's about the content in our opinion, right? So 
Game seven of the World Series, I think all Cubs fans are gonna sit through commercials tonight and they're gonna be happy with maybe the, the content that's being consumed, but um, you know, there's a trade-off, right? If, if FX shows are, are Emmy nominated and, and won 17 Emmys in the competitive set with the Netflix and the HBOs, you know, are they worth sitting through commercials and is that something the consumer's willing to put up with? And, and those are the things we're trying to test and learn about. And, and I don't know if there is a right answer today, um, but it is how do we experiment with a better user experience um, to maybe get them to consume more of our programs versus go somewhere else because they do get burnt out or, or bored. So uh, for us, it comes back to the content and trying to drive audiences through attracting them to watch our shows. I think the interesting thing too is, you know, the challenge, you know, from us, from a more media agency standpoint, we're always going to be looking for these alternatives. You think about, you know, we, we then have the obligation to deliver it from a creative standpoint and that can put a greater burden on the creative agencies then of how are they going to deliver. I mean, you look at some of those really cool, um, you know, interactive uh, commercials or pod busters or whatever, it's like that's more of a, a challenge for them to say, to think outside of the typical 15, 30, 60 kind of mentality. So on the one hand, freedom is great. On the other hand, you know, there's a certain freedom in having that constraint of knowing I just have to follow the same format. And, and somewhat uh, be careful what you wish for, because right. if, you, if you want that creativity as a creative division, you can now be held much more accountable. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the creativity around the the length of the pod, and you know, I, I haven't really paid much attention since it was announced, but I know Saturday Night Live was talking about limiting the commercial breaks and having more integrations. I mean, I've been watching the show, so I haven't really had a chance to, to, um, to see how that's coming to fruition, but I think that's a really creative way and a big platform to do something great for advertisers and actually great for the, you know, for the viewer. Yeah, we're seeing that, you know, the news came out with American Express doing something with the Today Show on the second hour of the programming and doing longer units there. At Turner and CNN, they're looking at longer units as well, and I believe Fox is looking yeah, at different. We've done some stuff. I think the, the Empire Pepsi example that won a bunch of awards last That's year right. is a great example. Those are extremely hard to pull off, and you do have to find a, an agency partner and a brand that are willing to, to do that, but I, I think that there is a future in trying to make that break almost part of the show, and mm -hmm. how you do that, I think, is, is still up to all of our creativity and determination, but it, it, those are hard to pull off, right? I think SNL might have an interesting opportunity because they have all those talent in the building and they can do stuff kind of on the fly. Um, but you know, And they've always had that, that, that great sales pitch of, hey, you never know whether it's an ad or a sketch. Right. You know, so people right. are paying attention to it. That's, that's, that's unique. But it, it does go, like earlier, I think it was um, Dan from Turner who was mentioning when it comes to TV, uh, it's not as easy to do programmatic as digital first thought, right, in terms of uh, there's scheduling and there's category exclusivity and there's you know all these sorts of things we're talking about that makes TV complex. Right. Um, so this is a perfect example of you know inventory in TV since it's finite is a little bit of a water balloon, right? If I'm going to give less spots on SNL or I'm going to give less spots here, it's going to push the spots somewhere else. And a company like NBCU or Fox has the advantage sort of of being able to, okay, I might have a couple less spots in SNL, but guess what? I just increased two spots over on Bravo, or I just increased three spots over on Sci-Fi, right? I'm going to take the money and back to the use of data here. Now I need the data in order to tell me where's, where are those other pockets of inventory valuable to that SNL advertiser. Um, so it's complex and sort of fun. With a big Good, puzzle piece. Yeah, great segue, Chris. In terms of, you know, as I think about and hear this dialogue, there's a lot more interchange that has to occur with the agency, with the brand client, and with the media outlets to make the interactivity work. Is that sort of a, a counterpunch to programmatic in terms of can you transact programmatically? And why my definition of programmatic sort of on a level playing field is it's just an automated workflow. It's a methodology of transacting with media outlets from a planning and a buying and, and literally a billing sense. And then if you're lucky, you can overlay data throughout those transactions. And with the data overlay, suddenly you have yield management. But when we're talking here about a lot of behind the scenes work and dialogue and expense, which we'll get to in terms of what's the cost and what's the pricing for this, can you do programmatic interactive or connected television advertising like this? I, 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 I think would you want to? Would you rather have a managed service? Is that yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I think the answer to would you want to is yes, because mm -hmm. you're talking about automating a workflow and making it easier to, to um, facilitate a sale and facilitate a, uh, a campaign. But I think it's a, it's a crawl, walk, run, right? We're talking about being able to execute on programmatic TV alone with 15s and 30s, and that's already, you know, has its own challenges. 
you know, we, we have an, an, a programmatic business. We call ours uh, Advanced TV. And, and you know, it's, it is the currency is currently 15s and 30s. I think the interactive units are so complex in and of themselves that trying to add that layer of complexity from a creative standpoint and then also trying to execute that programmatically, I, I think it's going to be tough. Agreed. I mean, it's a challenge today just to, you know, inter, inter, insert a programmatic ad into a mid-roll break and keep competitive separation and not, you know, upset some of your bigger direct advertisers to, you know, capitalize on one audience-based impression or whatever has triggered that response. Um, so yes, the short answer is we'd love to do it. We'd love to figure out a way to do it in a in a safe, keeping the integrity of the pod intact, um, and, and we're working on that. But it's it's not as easy as it it, it sounds, right? Um, sure. So. So it feels like we can leave programmatic to a certain segment of the marketplace where it's handling somewhat, I mentioned earlier, the mundane portions of the transactions. And when we have these really cool interactive type units, it's much more of a managed service and much more of a dialogue and interchange. It has to be. I mean, I think the reality is, as a couple of people pointed out already today, is even just, you know, quote unquote, regular programmatic is there's still a lot of manual in that automated service right now. So we've got a long way to go just to get there with 15s and 30s, let alone trying to take something much more complex than that. Right. Let's so solve the, that first. Exactly. Right. So those of you who are in the programmatic space, hang tight. We'll get there at some point <laughs> in time with this interactivity. Um, we talked about you know, the, these transactions that occur. And I'm curious in terms of your views related to pricing. And we'll talk about the cost of the, the creating the units and the agency dynamics in a bit. But first, I'd love to get a sense of you know, the traditional metrics in television where you, you buy on a spot basis. And then it started to migrate with audiences where you start buying on a CPM basis or selling on a CPM basis. Now in the digital world, you have the CPV, the cost per view, or CPCV, the cost per completed view. What do you think happens here with these types of units? Or does it follow suit with what we've seen historically with the direct response marketplace, where it's a CPA pricing model or cost per action, and you're only paying when somebody actively engages with the spot? I'd throw one more C in there, CPE, right? Cost per engagement. I okay. think that's really what it's got to come down to. If you're going to do something that's an inter interactive unit, if you're going to do something that's encouraging engagement, we shouldn't be buying it on, you know, on audience impressions. We should be buying it based on audience participation. What do you guys I think of this? Defined as what? What, do you, what, well, what, I think what would be it your... It depends, right? It depends on what the unit is. It depends on what our objective is. Um, you know, I mean, certainly when we're using video uh, from an automotive standpoint, we're using it both as an upper funnel device and as a lower funnel device. So if it's upper funnel, it ultimately is about did we change somebody's opinion? If it's lower funnel, it's, can, we, can they take an action? And if so, did they? And what was that action? What's the value of that action? Yeah, I, I think we, um, I, we've always charged on completed view anyway. So we don't really have a cost per completed view. You don't, if somebody watches 29 seconds of your ad and then <coughs> closes the, shuts the TV off, you don't pay for it. Okay. Uh, so we, we believe the value there. But I think with any of these units, uh, and I think you know, Trex has got some great ones, and, and you're talking about the opportunity cost of literally buying out a pod. So when you start looking at the different pod models of how many ads are in a pod and multiplying that by the CPM, a lot of these are kind of lost leaders for us because you know, if, even if you charge a $250 CPM for that interactive unit, you know, you've lost all of those spots in that pod. So you have to kind of tie that to a larger deal. Mm -hmm. Do you have people paying $250 a CPM? Anyone that would like to pay $250? <laughs> I'd like to meet them. I'll go for $249 at the end. They are not in this room. Well, you sure know, we, that, we yeah. started with, our, with the uh, a unit called the, the Branded Entertainment Selector, which is the worst name ever for an ad unit. If we could go back and undo that, I would love to. Mm -hmm. But that effectively, and, and Lisa, who's sitting here, was one of the first buyers of Honda back in the day, is uh, that allows you to buy out the entire stream. Okay. And you know, back then, you, know, you had one ad in a pod. It wasn't as much of an opportunity cost. And as the world has grown and ad loads have grown, um, the CPMs have grown uh, mm -hmm. commensurate with that, and they have to. It's just or the economics don't work. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of places where cable VOD and us as the technologists working with our programmers work hand in hand, a lot with Hulu. Like a lot of things that are in cable VOD uh, up, up, apply. Ad loads pretty much in cable VOD it could be the same as Hulu, things like that. One place we don't agree is not paying um, if it doesn't complete. <laughs> uh, for uh, in cable VOD, we count the first ad in play mode, um, and then that's it. That counts as an as a ad impression. And uh, frankly, we believe that it's then up to the creative if the person um, stays around or not, because we don't feel we have those, uh, where that came from was those classic broadband issues. 
right? Yeah. Of, oh, they didn't stay on the screen or scroll down or whatever that may be, it's been legacy. We don't have that problem in cable VOD. Um, you are on the TV, full frame, all along. Your sound's there all along. Uh, you're not gonna channel change because that's not the behavior in VOD. So well, we actually believe that uh, it's a, CP a CPM and it's on the first frame in play mode. We will say, okay, if, you have, if you're in a pod and you could fast forward and you did fast forward, then yes, you're not gonna pay. Um, but we do believe that it is uh, first frame in play mode. Yep. And I think you know, that's a fair model and the CPMs can reflect that, right? There's, there's room for both of those models. We're, I mean, we're in the CPM, CP world, right? So the, the action, what is it worth? Um, those Truex ads do sell on a CP model. And then the point about CPM for a, a two and a half minute break, what is that worth? What would that sell for versus then what is the engagement technically cost? Um, we've even gone as far to look at it as a cost per stream, right? So what is that half hour, hour worth, you know, based on the, the pod breakout that uh, Chris shared, you know, we're, we were expected, or at least our finance department's expecting to <laughs> see some revenue from those breaks, and you know, what is offsetting those or changing those going to do to our bottom line? And who, you know, when you think about the interactivity, who do you feel most comfortable with in measuring that interactivity? You know, we've got Nielsen, we've got Comscore, we've got third-party verification happening, or yourselves as media property owners, or the brand who, if you're driving traffic to a web or something to that effect, wh where do you feel most comfortable as an agency? I totally you? trust Facebook and everything they've done. <laughs> <laughs> Plus or minus 40%? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, you know, I mean, that, that, and being facetious, but I mean, there's the issue, right? Yeah. Right now, we're highly dependent on media providers for a lot of that information, and uh, we don't necessarily have full transparency in that. I mean. Nielsen's always going to be the ultimate currency, but uh, no offense to anyone from Nielsen in the room either, they haven't always done a great job of, of measuring audience. Uh, I love the fact that people like Rent Track are kind of coming up and giving them a, a run for their money, and it's much more, you know, uh, census versus sample kind of data, and, and that's intriguing to me too. But what I do love about all these kind of interactive products is the fact that we're getting more information back than just who watched. Right. You know, being able to see what ads they chose to skip, what ads they chose to watch, that's highly valuable information. And are you getting that data in a more, much more timely fashion so you can be reactive? I think so. Mid, yeah, mid yeah I mean, it, it could always be better, it could always be real time, but I think it's, uh, you know, we've come a long way in a very short time. And as media owners, do you have any hesitation in terms of providing that kind of detailed data? No, I mean, we, we would love to provide as much detail as the agency and the advertisers see fit. You know, some screens don't allow moat and things like that today, and, and those are going to continue to evolve. But, um, you know, certainly hold us accountable. Hold the, the, you know, brands whose media you're buying accountable. Facebook, you know, you brought it up. Um, you know, it's hard. We have to police ourselves. There are a lot of bad actors out there. So, you know, know who you're buying, trust who you're buying, um, and then hold them accountable from a reporting standpoint. In the, in the canoe point of view, I mean, we took that extremely seriously to the point of we went through the MRC certification, spent three years and a million dollars to get the seal of approval that's on the equivalent of Nielsen or Comscore. Um, so that when Fox and others are giving those numbers back to the agency, that um, they can feel good that those are MRC uh, validated numbers. Yeah, I think anybody in the st streaming space is challenged. Uh, you know, 70 percent of our views are in the living room now, and, and measurement just can't keep up with that. So we can see it, but you know, the old you can't grade your own homework kind of you know, philosophy is, yeah, we did great, we, you know, we, we can, we, but it's our numbers, you know, and we know they're true, we know they're right, but you are gonna need. I, I've never seen one of your presentations that doesn't have a positive uh, case. Study. We don't take those out <laughs> at all. Those are internal only, they're marked internal use only. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, you, you, you're going to, the agencies are going to hold us accountable for, for that. So I think as, as, the, as the vendors that we use, the Truexes and the Brightlines and the Innovids of the world um, are able to provide that as a, ostensibly a third party, you know, and they're, they're building it, measuring it, I think that, that should be a reasonable currency. So using currency as a baseline, let's step back for a second and think about what is the cost associated with creating these kind of spots? Is it a premium over traditional, more passive ads that you see? And as an agency, are you charging a premium to your brand clients or marketers in the sense of say, hey, if you really want to do this type of thing, it's going to cost that much more because it's that harder? Yeah, I mean, and not from us, again, keep in mind I represent uh, a media agency, so we're not involved in the creative development piece of it. I think it's more uh, just from a pure time-based standpoint that you're going to be doing more work and therefore it's going to take more hours, more time to be able to develop it. So 
Um, it's all about being selective. You know, it's not going to be one of these things where we're going to do it on every campaign or for you know with every media company, right? You've got to find the right place and then the, the right campaign where it makes sense, and then it's worth the investment. So, w does anyone have a sense of a 15, 30 second spot that's interactive, some, like the samples we've seen? What would be a premium on that production cost compared to what we see traditionally? That much more? Not much more? I mean, mm -hmm. as far as the, the cost, they're you know they're all rolled into what that CPE negotiation looks like. You know, we're not out saying, hey, we're upcharging this, but you know there are fees involved in creating those units. You know, yes, the short answer is yes, but mm -hmm. I don't know exactly okay. what it is. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll have a generally if it's a custom created interstitial, something that we do in house that our creative team does. We'll usually put in a ten thousand dollar placeholder as the as the creative fee, and that can go up or down depending on the complexity of the unit. Um, it's also negotiable depending on the overall media spend. I think that's probably a big part you of it. You know, that $250 CPM. Yeah, that, that $250 <laughs> CPM, that's we, might, we might waive the, the production fee. Yeah. But they, yeah, they are, I mean, all kidding aside, they are interrelated, right? If right. The, the media spend is there, then you can be negoti uh, negotiate on the, uh, on the production side. So let's assume we've got the production done, right? We're all excited about this new spot and we want to test it. What does the test environment look like? Is that different from what we've seen traditionally? Was it going to go back to the, the passive spots? You test something for a quarter million dollars, do you run it for a week or a month, or how do you gauge whether or not you've got a hot creative and it's engaging enough th to the CPEs or cost per engagements mm -hmm. that it's something you should roll out nationally and run for forever across a number of these media properties? I, I, honestly, I don't think we've done it enough where, you know, when we do it, we're committed to it. It's not really one of those things where you've got so much of an investment in time and resources to build out something like that, you're not gonna do it and, you know, just kind of walk away from it. Now you might get learnings from it and see what happens and react to it in more real time. Uh, but it really, I don't think there's any specific kind of test scenario for that. How about on the media Omar. side? Do you carve out any inventory that you would look to run tests like this to see if it engages with your consumers, your viewers? Uh, I mean, certainly, you know, our, our FX original pods are, are a great place to test this stuff, see what, you know, people are interacting with. We're doing case studies around it all the time to try to prove results, prove interaction prove brand recall um, and, and constantly just trying to feed those reports and that information back to the agencies to you know hopefully show that it's working and if it's not you know we'll, we'll try to tweak something or go in a different direction but um, you know it, ma it makes sense for a lot of advertisers based on what their objectives and their key results are right so if if it makes sense to do an engagement we'll do it and then do traditional ads after that or try to have some of that sequential messaging involved um, but it is you know case by case on, on each campaign and each advertisers goals yeah, in fact, uh, we got a call. I, I would say as, as much as we try to work with sort of that proactive ad units and pods and all of that, uh, that I showed, about once a week, we probably get a call from one of our 90 networks, and Fox has done this. Actually, you mentioned sequential is what made me think of it. It's got a call from Fox. And it's got a deal on the table. We want to be able to test something of, uh, you know, pre-roll is going to be uh, this creative, you know, call it 1A and then the mid-roll is gonna be uh, 1B, and the post-roll is gonna be 1C. Can we make that happen? And we kind of get together and go, yeah, we can sort of trick the system and manage to lock it down um, in a sort of linear fashion, but you know, be able to go back and say yes, and then they can call you and go yes, and everyone sort of tries. Um, so I think, kind of back to your question of can this stuff be problematic, I think that starts to drive the roadmap, right? If we all do that three or four or five or six times, <laughs> and it's successful, then I think that starts to drive the product roadmap of, okay, maybe that a bunch of people have asked for this and it's, uh, it's successful, then maybe it's time we started to automate that kind of thing. Great. Um, you know, when we think about these ad units and this interchange that you have with the, the brand marketer or the agency or the, the media property, the dialogue is occurring with individuals that have what I'll call unique skill sets. They're hybrid between a traditional television media expert and a digital person who understands how consumers interact. When you think about the talent landscape in an effort to recruit folks either on the agency side to create these spots or on the media ownership side who can envision how these spots could be placed across the great content that each of you have access to, how does that differ from your traditional television recruitment efforts that you might make in terms of taking talent in? Do you look for more of these digital folks now that have a, 
an affinity towards other media, or do you not discern it at all because it's so converged already? Yeah, I, I kind of feel like, you know, right now we're at a point where almost everybody is a, a bit of a digital native, so I think there's, you're starting to see those lines uh, disappear a little bit, where it's like, all right, that's the TV person, and then that's the digital person. I mean, for us, all of our uh, FEPs and uh, most of our digital video is purchased by the video team. We don't really have a TV team anymore, so I think that, that ship has sailed. For us, at least. How about Dan on your side? So you've got a team of sellers that are out there representing the Fox properties, and traditionally they're doing it as a linear television now have expanded to these digital opportunities. Yeah, I mean, we, we reorged about a year and a half ago, I think, to you know try to do a better job calling on our, our agency partners um, and to reach out to those video groups that aren't specifically looking at TV or digital, but looking at the Fox portfolio holistically, um, TV content on video as, as one not one screen, but it is television content across multiple endpoints. And you know, can we package it and sell the Fox audience collectively? Um, and there's been some growing pains, but we've made some great strides in, in bringing our sales teams together. And it's helped you know, our conversations at the agencies, I think, and taking our total portfolio to them um, to hopefully get in front of the right people with our, our brand. I'm kind of curious from, uh, you know, from a media standpoint, it would almost seem that one of the areas that we're going to end up impacting with a lot of this is the traditional traffic department, right? How, how much are they able to adjust to a programmatic world, to a world where it's not a, a standardized uh, pod, and what's kind of happening there? Yeah, um, it's been a constant learning experience. I think you're absolutely <laughs> right. I mean, we've got two homegrown traffic and billing systems and you know, just doing you know, the audience-based programmatic index buys that exist today. It's, it's already changed the way they look at things or, or think about things. and. Um, you know, digitally even so with our ad tech team here in LA, there's a lot of questions. It, it creates more questions than answers today, which is the challenge. Um, but it, it's a constant work in progress to try to make, you know, our advertising better. Or do you keep it in-house or outsource it? There are a number of firms out there today offering up some of those capabilities for traffic and billing and yield management of your properties. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I know that. I was going to say, I think it's, it's, the, it's uh, similar on the, on the ad development side as well as the trafficking side. You can go in-house, you can go out of house, and you work with third-party vendors. Uh, I know, you know we feel really strongly that there's a good combination to build and buy. So if somebody's got a great, you know, like, like an innovator or a Truex has got a great product that you can work with and you can plug in, then you should do it. At the same time, you know, we're hiring you know, tons of developers that specifically to, to focus on, on ad product because uh, you know, next year we're launching this live TV service and it's going to look very different and it's going to be a, a kind of a reinvention of the experience and you've got to say what's advertising going to look like in, in that situation. Right. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get a bunch of people now to be thinking about that later. And I think pretty much everybody's in that same boat. Like how, how, do, you, how do you find talent like that um, that's going to be thinking about what's the, next, you know, what's the next generation of ads look like? I think it's the next generation of ads, but it's also the next generation of viewers, right? There's a, a target audience that engages with these type of spots. And then there's another, maybe a larger set of viewers who say, I just want to sit here, have my glass of wine, and watch television. I don't want to have yeah. to do all this activity. That's not why I watch television. If I want to interact, I want to do it on my digital type device, not my big mm -hmm. fancy television. Well, I think that's why you always have to have an escape hatch. So I think in all the examples that you, know, you guys have and we have, you know, there's always got to be a way to easily go back to video. Uh, and also, if they don't engage at all, that it goes that they see no more than a 15 or a 30 second spot. And I think that's what I mentioned earlier about not making it work for a viewer, not making it too much work. Right. It should work. Right. It should be effective. <laughs> but don't make it feel like this is homework every time I have to do something to get out of here. I think you start putting those hurdles in and you really lose the viewer. And probably the best way to, to lower those hurdles is to have great content, right? It goes back, I always, you know, we talked earlier today or heard earlier today. Content is king, and I think that if you can create great spots that engage the viewer, regardless of their age or demographic, they'll engage with it. But if it's not any good, they'll get on social media and you know just blow it to pieces on you. So you're, well, you're not allowed to have a panel and not use the phrase "content is king." I don't know if you knew. <laughs> <laughs> really true. That's exactly right. Uh. So we are uh, winding down to a couple more minutes left, and I wanted to get a sense of um, some predictions on ad formats that we started to see occurring, and in in the next six to 12 months, we'll use 12 months as a window, 2017, this time next year, what will be the hottest ad format that either we're seeing start today or that we'll all be excited about, whether it's a five second unit or a 50 second or something, what do you guys think is the, the future? Um, two things, one, moving away from ad units, period, 
and moving to more just kind of content production, native in, in a video sense, I think is going to product you know, placement it's there. right into the pro. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's soon. I mean, months. it's there. It's been there for for years, but I think more I only and more. We see people. it in James Bond movies. I didn't know we'd <laughs> see it on traditional television. Yeah. So I, I think for sure that that's a piece of it, and I mean, to me, what I as I think we move to a more kind of over the top world you know, getting out of that, again, traditional pod and more and more interactive on a big screen. You know, I, I think device makers have got to get to a point where they really think about how do they build in a smarter mouse into your remote control. And I know some people have been trying to get there. It still frustrates the hell out of me to have to sit there and bounce through every single letter to try and, you know, key things into my, uh, into my DVR or, or when I'm watching shows, so you I can't just love to see that. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and anyone who has young children and has a big television, <laughs> I'm sure you've seen them. They go up to the screen and try to you know, move it forward like you do on your iPads. Mm -hmm. How about you, gentlemen? I do, you too, think? after a couple yeah. of glasses of wine. <laughs> One more glass and we'll be there. Uh, we're going down the line. I would say we didn't talk a lot about it, but I think integration, which is, I think, what you were uh, alluding to, in, into content. So in a traditional sense, it's been going on in the linear world forever, and you guys do it in you know, your FX originals, and we do it in our, our Hulu originals. I think creating an ad unit coming out of that that's related to what you just saw in the content, I think that's mm -hmm. gonna be big in the future. Um, you know, I think we still have a lot of work to do here, so it hurts to think that far ahead, but we're seeing some RFIs and RFPs already around virtual reality, some of our Fox okay. Sports VR apps. Um, I think it's going to be crazy, you know, trying to conceptualize that and what we can do is pretty exciting, but, um, and I also think the engagements will change, you know, I know there's been a lot from IBM about talking ads, and I don't know, there's going to be different things than just dragging a mouse and clicking something and picking if you like the red car or the blue car or speed or safety. Um, I think those engagements will become more robust and there'll be different ways to interact with the ad. Uh, can I do two quick answers? Sure. Uh, I want to do uh, another one then. Quick, quick as the key term here. Um, Otherwise, uh, we're fast forwarding you on this one. <laughs> uh, I, do, I do believe there will be more brand and entertainment because eight ads in a pod is just way too much. Uh, so I do think you'll see something like four ads in a pod with a frequency cap of two in an, any given episode, kind of what the balance we're finding. And that money needs to be made somewhere else. So it's $125. What was it? $250? $250. Well, it's going up. And uh, it's going, gone up going twice. And brand and entertainment. So that's number one. Number two is um, E, none of the above, interfacing. Uh, if any of you have Comcast and have the X1 interface, uh, it's phenomenal. And uh, a little fact of uh, VOD views. So the ads aren't different. The, the content isn't different, just interfacing through the X1. Um, VOD views go up 25 to 30% in X1 homes and in, in non-X1 homes. So just in pure interfacing for the consumer to easily get that content um, is going to be more important as more operators, um, they know that instinctively, um, but as deploy things like X1 and, and items like that, the interface. Um, but yeah. And while I have the mic, um, there's a canoe cell phone charging station, and it's 220, <laughs> so your phones are probably going out. So not only do we power VOD, but we'll power your batteries. So it's right out there, as I'm sure. OK. And on that plug, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> That's a good plug. <point. laughs>